Pink by Estelle Minas, grade 9. But why? The mutterings of four-year-old me some 10 years ago on a slightly cold, rainy Sunday evening. You could maybe call it a toddler's version of a midlife crisis. This included biting my nails, a temporary loss of appetite, and 133 long seconds of staring at the ceiling. That was when the answer came to me. A calling, you could say. I was going to be a rebel. No, a revolutionary. My battle cry? Hashtag pink must fall. That's right, I didn't like pink. Now challenging the system was big, very big. My protest had to start small. This meant nothing too drastic. Subtly insisting my sister have the last pink cupcake. No more strawberry milkshakes, sometimes. And when my sister voiced her wishes to be a pink lady after watching Grease, making it known that I would be a blue lady. My distaste soon became well known. It wasn't an easy thing having a daughter or granddaughter who was opposed to the color pink. Why on earth do Woolies only sell pink slippers? Where could I find a non-pink Barbie dream house? Very stressful, but eventually everyone understood. Even my aunts, when having to explain why I didn't wear that pink scarf anymore, would say, no, she doesn't like pink, quite the tomboy she is. Tomboy? I hadn't agreed to this, at least I didn't think I had. This was odd, very odd. What did boycotting pink and tomboy have in common? I didn't understand. But a tomboy I was. This now meant a soccer ball for Christmas, a Ben 10 watch, and playing with Ken instead of Barbie. And as I was looking at all my friends who had come dressed up as princesses to my sister and my pirate and princess party, I was sad. Sad because I too wanted to be a princess. I just didn't want to be a pink princess. I had never realized how a color could dictate my likes and dislikes, and how a color changed how people thought of me, and how I thought of me. Maybe if I said something, then everything would go back to how it used to be. Back to strawberry milkshakes, pink ladies, when a color didn't define me. But why? I still don't like pink. Hello by Anais Stradum, grade 11. Before me, feet firmly placed on cracked concrete, stands an army officer. His rifle is pointed directly between my eyes, his head tilted, eyes narrowed. The rust brown rifle is adorned in delicate lace. I force my eyes shut, and the landscape around me is swept away, morphing into silver skies. Raindrops like tears fall into my lap. A young woman to my left nudges me, then continues sifting through a mountain of coal in search of a four-leafed clover. A wrinkled hand unexpectedly presses on my shoulder and shifts my focus from the girl. My father stands numbly, arms outstretched, offering me a bouquet of dead flowers, their lifelessness matching his worn expression. The scenery warps before I can make any sense of my surroundings. My head spins and I cover my eyes with my palms to stop the consuming nausea. Reluctantly pulling my hands away after a while, I look down. My feet are dangling off a ridge, a place similar to what I imagined to be the edge of the world. I clench my teeth as a stinging pain erupts in my upper back. My brother's shadow covers my body in darkness. His hands are relentlessly cutting away at my wings and amongst the discarded feathers, I fall. With plaguing unease, my chest jerks up and my breath disappears. I have a passing taste of dry flour in my mouth. The smell of chemicals assaults my nostrils. A nurse rushes towards me, her hands stained red like autumn leaves. Wisps of golden hair escape her braids to form a halo around her porcelain face. Bad dream? 
she asks with upturned eyebrows and the frustrating, pitiful expression I've seen too many times. What gave it away this time? I retort, looking at the frost-painted window that protects me from the world, but still allows me to witness its cruelty. Shoes by Tyler Ratton. I remember my mother's hands, with the shoelaces dripping like candle wax down her soft fingertips, while she whispered to me with her voice like hot coffee, telling me to put on the shoes. I remember the soles made of white privilege and the seams stitched with old money and the rubber melted with luck and good fortune. The shoes that carried my family across oceans of change. Put on the shoes, she whispered again. I would have remembered, had I been aged by the world like good whiskey, I would have seen the tears in her eyes like shards of glass. Put on the shoes, she begged. She was my mother, so I listened, of course. Wore the shoes that blinded me from my own fortune, that walked over others' hardships like a tank over battlefields. Put on the shoes, they seemed to whisper. They carried me through primary school, walked into the private education system like they had no doubt about belonging there, striding through society's checkboxes and the public's judgeful eyes. See what they do when you put on the shoes. Maybe I would have kept walking in their misleading comfort, walked until one day they wore away, had it not been for them. The deep voices and wandering fingers. What shoes, they said. I don't see any. You see, the shoes had everything. The white soles and the gold stitching and the rubber luck. Everything except that. Everything except the laces stiff with X chromosomes like a starched collar. You can put the shoes on, but the laces are wrong, they said. I nearly left them, like lonely soldiers who never went to war. Had I not seen her. See, she didn't have the right laces either. She didn't have shoes. She had no white soles to walk her through hardships, no gold stitching to hold her luck together. She had bare feet, bare feet with discrimination stabbed into her toes. Where are your shoes? I asked. She didn't have any, didn't have a mother to give it to her, didn't have my luck. So I reached out a hand to her cracked and calloused one with a lump in my throat at the world I hadn't seen until I had the courage to take the shoes off. Put on the shoes. I whispered. Newly Born Flame by Emma Paul, grade 11. Her feet move gracefully through fields of yellow. Pollen swarms around her as she sweeps through the marigolds. Balanced simply by the weight of the hello crowned girl and the red horned boy perched comfortably on her shoulders. The smell of her salty tears mixed with the sweet honey scent of the flowers that perfectly matched the white robed girl's halo overwhelmed her senses. 
The boy's pointed tail flicked angrily against her back, slashing through her skin. He gave a cruel smile as he noticed the blood that seeped from her back matched his horns perfectly, but that wasn't enough. He whispered in her ear. His hot breath burned against her skin. She nodded solemnly and sat down in the middle of the meadow. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a box, opened it slowly and drew a single match. Finally, the halo crown girl began to whisper to her. The boy grew impatient and she twirled the stick carelessly between her fingers while she listened. His anger grew and he started to shout. Her ear was now scorching. She could no longer hear the angel's voice. She held the match steady as she flicked it against the box, watching the newly born flame flicker above her fingertips. She took a deep breath as she dropped the match, watching as a small flame grew. Red began to devour the gold. Smoke began to mask the sweet honey scent. She lay down and let the flame consume her along with the rest of the marigolds. It's cold outside and she's trying to scream. All that comes out is a puff of white. Her lungs are warm but the air is cold and the world is passing by so slowly. The birds are sitting on the barren trees and you can hear their beaks shatter as they hit the ground. The people pass by as they usually do. Their faces all look the same as they did yesterday. Her eyes are so hazy the glass seems opaque. Is this a window or a mirror? There's a tick, tick. And a rabbit starts screaming in a place far away. Three years, it's been too much. The flowers are big again and they're laughing at her. But their stems are frozen solid and they can't move. The streets twist and turn and change their signs once again. Porcelain breaks as dormice make homes out of people and teapots pour themselves. There's a tick, 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 and the thud overhead. Two-Way Deal by Emma Paul Bredlevin. With every tick, my impatience grew. With every talk, my breath sharpened. Gravel clawed at my heels while the cold night pecked viciously at my toes. Tick. I took a deep breath, inhaling the sweet scent of midnight dew and fresh soil. Talk. I let the breath escape my purple painted lips and watched as it danced past my eyes through the stars and towards the moon. Almost, I think to myself, tick. The howling wind painted a trail of goosebumps along my arms as it joined the chorus of crickets and night owls. Top. I squinted at my watch, he's late. I slid my back down the rough bark of the old oak tree that hasn't bloomed since Christmas four years ago. I slumped to the ground, Splinters embedded in my shoulders and hugged my knees tightly to my chest. Fingernails dug into the already scarred flesh. He wasn't coming. Tears stung my eyes as they begged to fall. I pressed my trembling palms as hard as I could against my now red and puffy eyes in order to hold back the oncoming flood. Suddenly, it felt as if my tears had turned into sharp icicles, piercing my eyelids. I began to worry that my eyes had frozen shut. A fresh trail of goosebumps coated my arms as I felt his long, arthritic fingers curl around my wrists. He lifted me off the ground as if all the mass in my body had disappeared. It was always strange to me how strong he was as he himself seemed to have no muscle or even mass at all. I stared up at him a figure of a tall, slim man concealed by a long black coat. His face, assuming he had one at all, was completely hidden in the shadows of his hood. The only visible part of him still clenched my wrist tightly. Hands, 
as pale as snow, each bone barely covering the paper-thin skin, every detail of every bone, every knuckle, clearly visible, but what couldn't be seen were his veins. He had none. He slowly released his grip on me. I stared down at the dents where his fingers and pierced my skin, but the sight wasn't as unusual one to me as it mimicked the scars. I left myself. I looked up to realize he had turned without a sound and had begun to float towards the woods. I ran after him. Leaves and sticks crushing by my aching feet soon became the only sound, as if all the crickets and night owls had fallen asleep with the rest of the world, or perhaps had gone into hiding. I followed him mindlessly like a sheep followed her shepherd. We continued for what seemed like miles until he suddenly stopped. He swept his hand through the air, presenting me what he promised. Mud crept between my toes as I walked towards the edge of the pond. I stared at the glassy surface and watched as a small ripple forced the stars trapped inside to dance like monkeys in a circus. I looked back at him. He nodded. And I turned back to the water. Thank you, I whispered as I began to walk into the star-patterned lake.